Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for what will be, I'm sure, a very interesting uh, webinar uh, around Switzerland and Crypto Nation Switzerland. Um, I am joined today by three uh, speakers um, who uh, have each their own uh, line of expertise. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Michael Zoller, who's Senior Project Manager for Greater Zurich Area, as well as Mr. Yassine Sheg, CFO of NIR Foundation, which is um, a full ecosystem around uh, everything that uh, we're talking about, as well as Dr. Matthias Skirt, who's Senior Associate uh, in the banking, finance, and capital markets team at CMS Switzerland with a special focus on um, fintech. So uh, thank you all for, for, for joining uh, today. And I, I'm going to start by you know, saying that we talk about uh, Web3 replacing Web2, but there's also a feeling that we're actually in uh, crypto 2.0. And so uh, today uh, we want to see Zurich and Switzerland who were really uh, one of the first locations where uh, the regulation was put forward, the infrastructure was put forward to have all these crypto uh, projects. How is it um, uh, evolving? And hopefully with uh, our, our three speakers, we can have different view uh, of how things are, are evolving. And I say that we, we're moving from a focus purely that was on crypto and and you know and trading crypto, which is still there, and there's all this hype that we know about, but to much more uh, infrastructure and deep project, ranging from uh, uh, DeFi and DAOs and all these concepts that I hope uh, our our, our uh, speakers will be able to enlighten us um, uh, on. So uh, I will start with, with you, Michael. Uh, thank you, first of all, for, for joining us and taking the time. Uh, and could you tell us, is Zurich, is Switzerland in this you know, Web3 uh, uh, revolution that we're, we're going through still relevant as it was at the beginning of you know, this crypto uh, uh, movement? Absolutely. I mean, what, what I can say from, from our organization is that we still have a lot of uh, inquiries from foreign companies who plan to set up shop here in our region. Um, it started uh, five, six years ago when we had a huge influx at the time of this, all, all these high ICO hypes. Um, but still, we see that uh, kind of the, the projects become more substantial, more hands-on and um, yes, absolutely. There is still a trend and the trend goes upwards and the curve shows into a very promising future. So could you tell us more a little bit about, you know, how things are evolving? What, what, what are the, um, the, 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 the steps that you take in uh, the Great Zurich area? Uh, and what are you doing currently around um, uh, these, these opportunities? Uh, we, we try, we of course try to, to attract the companies and we try to help them to, to set up shop here. I mean, we, we connect them with the ecosystem, we connect them with the investors here, we try to help them finding the right people, we try to help them, um, you know, in, connect them to the right people from a tech side, also from a legal side. So we, what we can offer is the, the whole ecosystem which is needed to, to set up uh, operations within our metropolitan region, which is actually not only Zurich, but also includes Zug. Uh, I will have uh, some numbers later on, and surely also the other speakers will talk about Zug, which is kind of the, I don't know, the, the, the natural born place of the Crypto Valley, which uh, made also international um, headlights. Um, yeah, so we are here to help all the foreign companies to, to have soft landing, let's say a soft landing in our economic region. And, and so if we, if we keep, keep look at uh, what this region has to, to offer in your view, is it because, uh, is it ease of doing business? Is it taxation? Is it talent? What makes, 
you know, Zurich a ideal point for or hub for this, you know, new uh, revolution within the financial sector uh, related to blockchain and um, uh, crypto. I think there is a number of uh, factors which uh, kind of shaped uh, our ecosystem. Of course, uh, the availability of talents. I mean, uh, there is a really high number of deep tech talents in, in computer science coming out from the world renowned ETH Zurich, uh, but also the University of Zurich. Then, of course, the, as, as, as a whole, the stability of the country, um, of course, also highly attractive corporate and individual taxation. And of course, also the, the ease of doing business. I think this has always been a strength of Switzerland as a whole, um, but also of Greater Zurich area in special because uh, the ecosystem here is all, uh, from a geographic perspective, all very near. I mean, we're talking about 20 minutes uh, geographical distance from Zurich to, to, to Zug. So people know each other, people can easily mingle, people can exchange opinions and uh, kind of build up projects together. So I think th there is a number of uh, substantial factors which are kind of the, the ingredients of the success story of this uh, crypto value ev ev evolution of the last five, six, seven years. And, and so uh, how, how uh, in terms of numbers, you know, do you have, you know, figures you could share on uh, you know, new, estab new established companies, number of, of projects that, that are there, uh, generally speaking? Yes. Um, we, as an organization, we had just uh, had a closer look at our annual report a few days ago. And last year, we had a, a total of roughly 100 new settlements. But these are not all coming out of the blockchain and crypto scene, of course. Um, we, our economic region also has a lot of settlements from, from the biotech scene, uh, from drones and robotics, from advanced manufacturing. But what is, uh, what is the same about all these settlements is that it's all coming from deep tech, future-oriented technologies. Um, and in the blockchain scene, we also have seen uh, quite a, a number, but I do not have the exact numbers yet since we're still doing the the, the, the analysis of the, of the numbers in each individual technology. But roughly we, we see around 100 new settlements per year, even in the last, even in the last two years during the COVID crisis. Wow. And, and so you, the, the greater Zurich area, I mean, your institution acts basically as a one-stop shop to help, uh, you know, new project be established and, and you know, uh, give the lay of the land and, and you know, how people understand, am I correct? Excellent, that's exactly the point, Khalid. I mean, what mostly it starts with, with an inquiry from a company from abroad, let's say a company from America who plans to set up operations for a European hub, and they're looking for a different, they kind of comparing different jurisdictions. So maybe they had a close look at Frankfurt, they had a look at London, or they had a look also at the Greater Zurich area. And then we try to, to help them to find the necessary data, how much does it cost to, uh, to set up a company, uh, how much do I have to pay in terms of salaries, where do I find the best office solutions, uh, what is the best way to recruit talents, how can I maybe collaborate with, uh, with research institutions such as ETH or, or other University of Applied Sciences, um, how can I connect with relevant associations and investors, so what we offer is kind of a, the whole package, which is relevant uh, for foreign investors to, to, to have a, yeah, we call it a soft landing that they can really focus on their core business and then uh, roll out their operations within, within our region. And what we see often is that, especially from American or also from companies from the Far East, um, that they start uh, like establishing a hub in Switzerland and then do kind of a European headquarter operations. So they don't they do not only do business in Switzerland, but they kind of plan from here uh, with their hub in Greater Zurich area, the, the rollout uh, in all over Europe. Interesting. So start. I'll, yeah. I, I'll drop to Yassine uh, because case in point, I mean, Yassine, you're the CFO of um, a, uh, a, a near foundation, which is uh, based uh, in uh, the Greater Zurich area. And so first of all, if you could 
tell us more about near foundation what 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 what, what does it do and as well how do you see switzerland empowering uh, your objectives whether on a regulatory base that will we will go through it uh, with uh, dr Kurt later on but generally speaking the connection to the rest of the world how does it play out for you uh, sure um so the near foundation just came to switzerland about two years ago and if you think um, bitcoin being sort of the first proof of concept the first blockchain uh, protocol then ethereum being uh, programmable uh, including smart contracts was a second generation and you can think of near being a third generation blockchain protocol because it is uh, carbon neutral scalable simple um, and it is the first uh, truly shorted blockchain protocol and by that uh, um, allowing for uh, tra doing transactions which are really secure at a very low fee and uh, coming with all the benefits of, uh, of Ethereum as well. And um, well, the reason the foundation set up in Switzerland is uh, particularly the ones which Michael listed with the neutrality, stability, um, taxation, it's great to do business, but uh, also because there were other projects setting up and showing how, how easy it is to set up in Switzerland. Uh, so of, with the most prominent obviously being Ethereum, um, and uh, then we have, currently we have the Web3 Foundation being here, Cardano, Tezos, and it was a natural for near to set up uh, as well. And um, there, I think there's one point which is underestimated, it's like this individual rights, um, which uh, citizens and residents in Switzerland have, because that's very much aligned with the Web3 vision. It's about empowering uh, the people so they can take ownership of their own assets and data and that's not sitting just with third parties. And these individual rights um, and, and neutrality, stability, safety, I think that's that's very welcoming. And I mean, beyond that, there's also the, the authorities. Uh, I think they're very constructive. I think they're, they make, and, and it's not about uh, like uh, authorities closing the eyes. It's rather making clear what the rules are. So then the, the, the transparency, what are the rules really? And, and then um, doing, and, and, and then uh, really abiding to that. And so here in Switzerland, you can really talk to the authorities, be it the FINMA on the financial regulation side. So projects can come forward and get a ruling and, uh, to, and get to understand what are the limits of what they can do and, you know, what, uh, and how would their token and their project being looked at from a regulatory perspective, so they have legal certainty. I think that's really the value add. And also on the tax authority side, you can get a tax ruling, you can approach the tax authorities and discuss the new technologies and, and get certainty out of that uh, and get that in writing too. And that's, that's very helpful for the long term to operate, taking all these uncertainties away. Um, I think that's, that's been very helpful, like this transparency of the rules. Um, and then we have very low corruption as well, um, and, and this federal tradition with so many cantons which have to collaborate with each other, so there is a lot of uh, people are used to compromise, uh, doing compromises, that, that, that opens up culturally, so that's also very welcoming to many cultures, and so, um, yeah, near foundation set up in Switzerland, it's been a, a success story, we're very, very heavily growing, so the technology is great, so we also needed to uh, beef up on uh, on the people side and people coming to Switzerland, working in Switzerland, uh, they really enjoy it because the standard of living in Switzerland is is fantastic too. Could you could you explain a little bit more about you know you you mentioned the links with Ethereum? Is it a competitor to Ethereum or is it something complementary to Ethereum? What what is uh, what is the Near Foundation and and how does it uh, function and on the international level, you, you've mentioned, I mean, locally in Switzerland, you have, you know, access to, you know, regulators and so forth. But on an international level, how connected is it? How easy is it to develop on an international level as well? Yeah, so to your first question, I think the Web3 environment is, is it's still early days. And so I uh, see that we are very much collaborating on the same vision with Ethereum. So we, we want to put the, 
the data and the assets in, into people's hands and um, enable people to implement their creative dreams. And so in that sense, we want the same like it is. And um, I think there's also learning from each other in, in that sense as well. And uh, to, to address your second question, can, can you repeat that? <laughs> I mean, you, you've mentioned that, you know, we're seeing the, I mean, it's, it's, there's something that is, that is quite interesting because you look at, uh, it's true that Switzerland is a bottom up uh, type of uh, business environment, political and so forth. And we might be more used uh, to the opposite in, in other places uh, in, in, in Europe as well. But when you have this, you know, global competition and regulations that are stepping in uh, around uh, crypto and around, you know, uh, digital assets, uh, how does this connection work with the rest of the world? So do you, how do you develop that? Yeah, I mean, what's great is that Switzerland is a, is a pretty internationally um, well-organized and compliant jurisdiction. So projects coming to Switzerland um, and doing an ICO, they have to do uh, KYC to very, very high standards, which are internationally acknowledged. And by that, that take a lot of safety from that as well. It's um, collaborating with authorities on what specifically has to be done to comply. And so they get a lot of support. And once that's in place, they get also the safety uh, on an international level uh, to, to a considerable extent. Because uh, the authorities will um, are very happy to take very legit projects. And uh, there's, there's also a certain crackdown on, on uh, I'd say, scams and the like. So they won't even feel comfortable setting up in Switzerland. Um, and I think there's a benefit out of that for sure. But Switzerland is very well connected internationally. So, that, so there are a lot of benefits coming out of that as well. Being in the heart of Europe, of course, um, and then with its tradition with the United Nations and so on, I think that, that uh, uh, provides for certain benefits as well, I guess. And, and so could you tell us more about, you know, I, I mean, I, I've, uh, part of my activity is, is, in, is in Dubai where we have, you know, uh, media city and we have uh, uh, the IFC and we have also in Abu Dhabi ADGM and and so this creates sort of a hub of a community where you know you meet like-minded people it create it empowers creativity it empowers new project do you with near foundation being based in um, in Switzerland feel the same feel that there is this crypto community that is building that is developing that is enhancing yes um it's definitely a very thriving ecosystem we have um trust square in in zurich and in zug we have various hops where people um so just crossing the street uh, you'll you'll um, meet people building on uh, other layer one uh, um, block, uh, blockchain protocols so that's that's certainly in place as well there are a lot of conferences i think just right now there's one in sankt moritz and um yeah we have uh, there are meetups on a regular basis so, uh, so th this ecosystem is certainly here uh, for sure and it's quite a network around that given that there's so many projects building up and also these layer one blockchain protocols of, of which there are seven or eight in switzerland alifium being the, the latest to which just launched and attract a lot of projects building on top and they also take uh, that as a role model. So that's that's why maybe a first one which was Ethereum. And then in 2017, we saw this ICO craze. They naturally wanted to set up closely to Ethereum too. And, and, and therefore you, you had a growing ecosystem around uh, around Zug and, uh, and Zurich. I, 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 won't go as well, in, by the way. I, I won't go into the debate of, uh, you know, the, the, the layer war or or so forth, but in your view, is it uh, several can live side by side or will it be a winner take all model? You mean in the long run? Well, for yes. it will be a side by side for very long because these projects are very cap well capitalized. They have um, each has a growing community, uh, some are growing faster, and uh, therefore it's 
it, it will be a side for side for long. But I'm getting this question often. Uh, you know, will there be just one blockchain or will there be many uh, going forward? And I think the um, uh, diversity will increase over time, but we'll also see more um, interchain communications, but we'll also see very, very big winners uh, because if it, it's just helpful. Um, there, are, there are network effects and it's helpful if people are, and projects are on the same chain. That's uh, obviously then the, the scaling and network effects kick in the most. But I mean, there's so many, there's so much growth and so much ca capital coming in so that many of these projects, even when they don't develop uh, any tech anymore, they will survive for another 20 years. <laughs> so this is, uh, don't, don't develop any tech and still continue. This is quite a, a good one. I, but I have, you know, I have some, some I'm going to jump to Dr. Quirt and, and ask him a few, uh, I mean, uh, lay of the land on the regulatory level, because I think this is, this is key for the, the future and what is happening. But I have a, a question about, I, I'll jump, if you, if you have the time after that, to around centralized, decentralization, and aren't we going to go through centralization and re-decentralization, uh, I mean, and go back to centralize everything through uh, different proxies and different, uh, different way, but I'll, I'll get back uh, to, to you on, uh, on that one. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yassine. Uh, Matthias, uh, thank you very much for, for, for joining us. It would be interesting to to see, you know, we're we're reading a lot in in in, you know, different sources, media, so forth, and there seems to be a greater focus from authorities to start, you know, having a closer look, whether it's tax authorities or on a regulatory level and legal level, and so if you could, you know, give us a bit of a landscape of what is happening and how things are 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 changing. Generally. Uh, and that's what, what Yesin already mentioned. We, we have this ICO boom, and then uh, there was really a Wild West mood in Switzerland. Uh, no uh, regulations, I mean, no specific regulations. And uh, in the wake of that, the, the Swiss uh, regulator noticed that uh, it had to do something. And then I guess uh, as one of the, of the first regulators, the FINMA published this uh, famous, let's say, I guess, uh, ICO guideline with the uh, token qualification uh, between payment tokens, asset tokens, respectively security tokens, and uh, utility tokens, which kind of has been a, a, a model, I guess, uh, also in, in other jurisdictions. And then at the same time, FINMA also uh, investigated in, in some of the ICOs and, and ultimately uh, also deemed some of them uh, un unlawful. But uh, what, what we are seeing more and more now is that by, by uh, say since FINMA uh, now did the base work and really uh, has set out the, the applicable uh, legal framework uh, projects uh, come to Switzerland, and want to be compliant. And as Yesin uh, mentioned, uh, since FINMA offers you the possibility of obtaining a ruling concerning your project, this will allow you to kind of uh, check the, the red lines and, and ultimately have a uh, in a legal, secure manner, a uh, project uh, in, in place which is lawful in Switzerland. Yeah. Do, you, do you have, you know, uh, like if you would like to go in a, in a deeper, you know, uh, insights and look and even feel free to share some, uh, some slides, uh, you know, for I think the audience, you know, everybody's looking for substance because there's a lack of clarity and a big part of, you know, launching these new projects, especially today where, you know, the biggest risk is this one, is the regulatory risk. Uh, if you could 
highlight on you know these changes and this transformation i think it would be very very interesting i can do that i try to to share a few slides do you yes yes we can see you okay uh, i mean i will i will mention two things uh, on the one hand we we have this regulate which really offers the offers you the possibility to obtain the ruling on the other hand we had a, a recent enactment of new so-called uh, blockchain DLT distributed uh, ledger technology laws uh, which were enacted and are now uh, in effect and can fully be profited from basically with the goal to to uh, accommodate the needs of uh, blockchain ventures by uh, and that's the buzzword creating greater legal certainty and maybe two uh, topics illustrate that the first one is the whole topic around uh, the tokenization uh, of of rights in particular uh, equity or or debt rights and how it can be catered for that if you transfer the token over the blockchain also the underlying a right, which can be uh, a debt instrument, which can be equity in a company, will be transferred. And there, Switzerland and a lot of other jurisdictions face the problems that, in principle, a transfer of rights requires a written instrument. And obviously, if you, if you, you know, transfer a token via the blockchain such written instrument will not be present and now the swiss uh, legislator not finma but really the legislator uh, uh, tackled this problem by by enacting these new uh, dlt blockchain laws and created the so-called uh, uncertificated register securities which is an instrument by which you can now tokenize rights including uh, equity securities, issue them over the bronze chain and transfer them uh, with, without a uh, written instrument is required. I won't go into the details, maybe you can share the slide afterwards. Uh, but this allows you, for instance, if you have a, a group of companies uh, to uh, incorporate a holding company in Switzerland and uh, for, for financing purposes uh, issue your really your equity shares in the form for instance of uh, uh, participation rights over the blockchain which uh, uh, is, is, is uh, quite uh, unique in the world, since you can do it here in Switzerland in a really legally certain manners and do not need uh, any workarounds as in a lot of other countries. And then maybe uh, uh, another very important topic uh, with respect to token and uh, cryptocurrencies is the secondary market trading. And here, as you will be aware, there are uh, a lot of uh, exchanges uh, present on the market, but uh, most of them, let's say, are, are, are not uh, really properly regulated or at least uh, act in a gray area. And here, uh, this was also noticed by the Swiss uh, legislator, and he created, therefore, the license uh, for so-called TLT trading venues, which are basically uh, crypto, respectively, digital asset exchanges. 
and uh, over which now if if uh, the, the institutions obtain uh, such license uh, tokens can be lawfully traded that that are maybe two highlights how uh, the, the the Swiss a regulator, first of all, the FINMA, but also the, the, the Swiss uh, legislative tie tries to, to tackle the problems the industry has. And that's also a reason, I guess, for projects to, to closely look at Switzerland. Uh, Matthias, I'd like to, to ask you a, a, a question is that this regulatory landscape that you, you're mentioning, is it converging towards the same as uh, the securities landscape? And so are we, I mean, not only in Switzerland, but globally looking at the securities market and uh, digital assets or blockchain assets, crypto NFTs looking alike in the terms of, you know, being able to issue them market them and, and trade them? I mean that that's the idea I guess but in the in the token field uh, without that you need all the uh, intermediaries which you currently need in the in the securities field but but uh, it depends in addition on the type of the token, obviously. If, if we are talking about the uh, digital assets, that's, I mean, exactly, I guess, the development which we see. It's those digital assets, uh, assets which correspond to securities, they will also uh, be deemed the uh, securities and therefore have also to comply with the rules for securities. But on the other hand, we have uh, the payment tokens, which are la rather conceived as money and, and therefore basically have to uh, comply with the rules that that money has to comply with and do it. Uh, and therefore issuers have, for instance, to do the, the KYC checks uh, which which he has mentioned Be because when you accept money you have also to do the K KYC checks and then we have the utility talks which I also mentioned which are if they are proper uh, utility tokens rather uh, unregulated uh, instruments. Uh, Yasin, I'd like to to ask you. I mean. As these, these, you know, these layers that are being built, these infrastructure layers that you, you mentioned are being built, uh, if there's a convergence in the regulatory aspect, does it make them uh, less useful, or does it still does it, do, are they still relevant? I mean, I tend to believe, and I go back to the, you know. We, we're looking at decentralization, but and disintermediating all these intermediaries that uh, that uh, uh, Matthias mentioned. But what I'm noticing, and I'm only a layman, so I'm asking the expert. So I, I just to just to be clear, what I'm noticing is that you're starting to have going from you know even in DAOs and and the voting system where people are giving their votes to somebody else, and you're starting to have groups. And I'm seeing like a sort of mirroring of what we have in the real world. So will it still make sense? And if yes, why? So um, we, have, we are looking at the great technology um, with, with decentralized uh, ledger technologies. Um, we can, we, we suddenly have a tool or additional tools where we can tackle things like global warming or, uh, you know, helping the unbanked get banked or using the tools of decentralization. So where there's, there are certain central powers which took away your data, your assets, and, um, and also your governance. And we could give that back to the user um, so that people that are creating things also get the fruits and that doesn't accrue just to some central parties. So we have fantastic benefits. And with that comes a certain amount of responsibility 
uh, build it in a way that the, 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 because the, with this responsibility, there can also come certain disadvantages. So you can lose your keys, for example, or it, it can be abused by having privacy decentralized matters. You can use it maybe for illegal activities, etc. And my personal view is that the industry, while providing this technology to society and, and human mankind, also have to think about these problems it can create and think, think about these global problems which we have. And uh, there, all the regulation which we have targets at central financial markets. So it's not necessarily the best fit to just apply the existing approaches to, um, to, to the new technologies. But to some extent, that's the first step just to get on top of things like the KYC rules. And I think that the, the projects should uh, totally respect that and make sure that they are accepting money from uh, like legit resources. But it also requires a dialogue of what are legit resources, right? So sometimes superpowers are abusing uh, the, the legislation for their political agenda. And then there needs to be a dialogue of, you know, what, what are good rules which help human mankind and help to tackle like uh, problems like system stability or abuse of uh, uh, people that don't know any better, right? That's where financial laws seek to protect. And so how can that be programmed into the chains, into the solutions, into the projects building on top. That's like what, what I find very appealing. And that's where there's a certain disconnect, maybe where you're, you're asking if like traditional regulation comes on to DeFi, will DeFi be ineffective? And yes, there, there is a certain conflict and certain risk. There are certain projects um, which should have given a bit more room for sandboxing will, 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 uh, will become victim of that. But others will, will survive. And the, the, I think the regulators, they, they also want to, ex some, some are democracies, but, and uh, have, they, they want to have um, extract the best for, for society, right? And so the, I'm, I'm very much believing that we'll find in the very long run, a, a very good home for this technology and that there, there will be a, a good dialogue uh, around fixing these challenges. But there will be some uh, 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 yeah, conflicts and um, that, that's, that's natural, I guess, in order to see progress. I'll, I'll ask a question to, to Matthias and then we'll, I'll open the floor for, for questions from people in the audience. Feel free to, uh, to, to raise your hand and I'll, I'll give you the, the floor. Matthias, has the way you, we had a sentiment that most um, uh, crypto or, or, or uh, blockchain projects uh, within the financial sector were more of uh, uh, ask for uh, forgiveness rather than permission. Uh, has, have things changed in Switzerland whereby now they ask for permission or we still have the same situation where, you know, it's like, uh, building it and then, you know, trying to solve it uh, uh, and seeing how things go? Well, I mean, we see, we see still both. We, obviously, our advice is clearly go the uh, permission approach because uh, if you uh, try it without uh, having uh, obtained uh, legal certainty, uh, regarding your project and then uh, everything goes wrong uh, uh, unless you are a project where it's really clear look this is a utility token which can be used in a in a game for instance and there is no a uh, financial side let's say attached to it but when uh, it comes to the uh, gray area, we really suggest a permission approach. The reason being simply these permissions, or at least knowing what you can do and, and uh, what you cannot do, uh, they, they cost something also from a, from a legal perspective, but they are not uh, that expensive. And, and in any case, uh, you will not go to jail for that. Otherwise, if you if you in the gray area just do something with, without having obtained their legal advice, with, without having obtained the FINMA ruling, 
uh, and then uh, the, the project will be investigated in and, and ultimately uh, be sanctioned, then you might go to jail, you, you might have to pay fines, and, and uh, it, it, it's not fun anymore. Therefore, uh, it's uh, with a lot of legal advice, in fact, the case. Also, uh, when it comes to contracts, for instance, uh, a lot of uh, clients uh, often have in mind, look, uh, we think even when it comes to a, to a special project for them, look, we, we simply draft up this contract or we, we, we draw this contract from the drawer which we used last time and use it again. And uh, uh, then, for instance, a jurisdiction clause is missing and they, they, uh, they, they, uh, uh, a dispute arises between the parties and they will fight their uh, own jurisdiction for two years and, and each party uh, will, will pay uh, several hundred thousand francs for only that fight. Whereas if they would briefly have asked the lawyer, that would have cost them thousand francs to get the contract reviewed and, uh, and, and the dispute could be avoided. That's a bit uh, an analogy, I guess. Uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, please feel free to, to you know, to, to request the floor, and I'll be happy to to share it. Uh, I'll just, uh, in the meantime, I'll ask uh, uh, Michael uh, a question. Uh, there, there's, there has been a, a, a link sometimes, you know, a, a, let's say a bad reputation between, I mean, the light one being uh, the pump and dump schemes and the, the bad one being uh, like Ponzi schemes, do you think that there is still a risk of uh, crypto impacting badly the reputation of Switzerland? Or do you think that there's sufficient uh, safeguards today to build Web3 in a nice and proper manner? What do you think, uh, Michael? Can you... Can you hear me? I'm all the time a bit interrupted. I'm actually in the home office. I have some connection issues. Can yes, you hear we can me? hear. Hello, can you hear us? Hello? Yes, we can yes, hear. Yes, but I, I, I didn't understand the question. Sorry, I was like so all, what, on, what on and off. That, what I meant is that uh, we, we, are, uh, uh, we are in the middle of, you know, a, a, a burgeoning industry, a new industry, a new way. We talk about Web3, uh, crypto is changing. And so the, the, the key question was, can still mistake happen that uh, impact negatively uh, Switzerland and the greater Zurich area? Uh, or do you think that there are sufficient safeguards to make sure that uh, you can build your project, but you have to respect the rules and move uh, forward? I think with the latest developments, which, which went on with, uh, with the regulators here, also with FINMA, um, which have implemented also the, the legal procedures and the legal securities. Um, I think we are definitely now on, on the right way to, to really attract only like uh, really substantial projects, uh, which have also a long-term future. Uh, so I think the work, the legal work has been done, but it also has to be monitored more and more what are the, the, the latest developments in this field. Um, but I think uh, we are really on the right track here also with these close collaborations and this kind of uh, um, um, bottom-up approach together with the industry, which, which really the, the local regulators follows instead of the, the top-down approach so that you kind of co-develop together with, with the industry and the experts uh, certain legal, legal frameworks uh, to, to be also on the safe side here. Yeah, so, if, if I might jump in on this one as well, I think it's it's definitely the regulator that sets the tone, but it's not just the regulator, it's the banks, service providers, uh, um, which all uh, want to disassociate from any uh, like scams and the like. It's very hard to get a bank account nowadays, so in the, um, projects need to convince banks that they are um, legit projects and service providers just want to engage with uh, with 
projects that have a long-term um, positive outcome. And I think that's, that makes it really hard for scams and scams will probably operate in an area where they don't need to have a, a jurisdiction at all, right? So they, they don't want to have a bank, need, needing a bank account uh, Co completely operating crypto and out of a shady place and not s establish a legal entity and therefore it's like scams are not tied to any jurisdiction at all but legit projects that want to set up properly then uh, look at jurisdictions like Switzerland and, and other places too. So we're starting to have uh, some, uh, some questions I mean, the first one uh, we received, uh, I think uh, it might ad be addressed to you, Yassine, is like, what are the new uh, uh, cryptos area developing uh, the, the more, what is the, the, you know, the business trend when it comes to, uh, to crypto today? Where do you see uh, things evolving? Yeah, I think the, um, there's certainly three areas. Two are quite transparent and one is uncertain, unclear. One is NFTs, is a very big thing. And the DeFi space, like innovation uh, in, in, in the financial space on chain, I think these are the, the, by, by far the biggest topics, the biggest trends. And the third one is like a bit, a bit on the business side, more and more companies, uh, enterprises start to experiment with crypto but it's, it's not too visible because uh, it, it will still take a while that, that products become mainstream driven by the business. So, so I think the, then the prevailing and visible two streams are NFTs and DeFi. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question addressed to, to Matthias. So the question goes to uh, Matthias is, do you think it's possible to pack a business ID into a smart contract instead of a company, meaning not to have a headquarter, no responsible people. Uh, with that, you don't have to care about any regulatory issues. Is, is this a, D, uh, yes, just before my chance answer, is this the concept of a DAO? That the yeah, a DAO basically, uh, I mean, a DAO is, a, is basically an organization that packed on our contract, but you can have like the 50 shades of gray between a smart contract is, is just a program that uh, runs on chain and you can run a business out of it. And actually, it's probably when it's in the financial space, it becomes controversial. But there are uh, a zillion of use cases where the, 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 the business is just you know, harmless and you can do it on chain without running into any legal issues too. So homeowners, yes, um, homeowners. Experiment homeowners, with DAOs. That, that are being ripped up by uh, 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 property uh, management companies. Homeowners sh should do this, I think. Anyway, uh, yeah, Matthias, Elaborate a bit further on. I, I'll, I'll get back. Uh, so what I mean is like, you look at um, uh, property management companies, they just put costs left and right. And you know, you vote for the board, they uh, name a, a property manager, and then you get, you know, costs coming left, right, and nobody understand, nobody. If you have used a DAO, I've been pronouncing it uh, wrongly since the beginning, thank you for correcting me, that, you know, manages everything related to your, your, your property. The property is co-property. You know, in France, we have what we call the syndic. If you have something that enables people to vote constantly and to make the decision together, well, in that case, I agree. If you move away from the financial sector, it, it makes a lot of sense. Sorry, uh, we, we diverted a little bit we go back to the core of the subject, Matthias, I mean, can you become basically reap the benefits of a business without the responsibility? Because this is the core of the, uh, of the question, yeah, just that, by putting it in a smart contract. That, uh, that, Please say uh, yes. I, I mean, look, what Yesin was right. I mean, there are areas which are not that sensitive. If you sell tokens for, a, or if you distribute tokens, uh, which can be used in a computer game, uh, that's not, you know, something a, a regulator will care about. No, probably almost no uh, regulator in the world. But then we, we have the, you know, financial uh, services, which, which can be provided also over the 
the blockchain. And here, uh, what one has to understand, once there is an activity that can harm creditors, that can harm investors, uh, the, the regulator will, will look at it. And therefore, in principle, now uh, the, the question which matters is whether there is such an activity and, and, and this activity can also be uh, deployed through a smart contract. But then uh, the question, which is the, the really the, the crucial question, I guess, uh, uh, arises, who is responsible? And here, obviously, uh, if you have a smart contract, uh, if you have, uh, if everything is very decentralized, it's uh, more difficult to find the responsible person. But uh, as everybody here will be aware, there is a kind of a uh, responsible person because somebody uh, has drew, drawn up the code somebody has uh, put this uh, software into the world and uh, until the regulator gets there, it's a long way, but uh, the, the picture that there is nobody responsible is, is, uh, is simply uh, not, not accurate. I mean, it, it's a bit uh, a risky comparison, but, but you have the same uh, discussions uh, 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 you have the same discussions in for when it comes for instance to 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 genocides with with the guy who he who was threatened by by a order to do something bad but but ultimately uh, it, it the guy had still to do it you know there you, you know that there's something who, that there are people who do something not not merely uh, machines. But let me ask you something. I, I want to go back because I think it's an interesting question. Is like uh, if we take the, the 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 DAOs and and you know the smart contracts and you have many people. If I'm and I, if I'm uh, mistaken on how it, it works, please correct me. Many people taking the decision. So it's not like a board or a CEO, you, every decision is brought to the entire community that decides on business decisions. And let's say these business decisions that many people vote on cause harm. So who's responsible? And once you've created this structure that is, you know, in a smart contract, indeed, do you need to also create a company? It's, I think it's, it's a very core question. I'll let you uh, but it's not a new problem. It is, um, I mean, that's how shareholders' companies work as well, right? There's voting too. And uh, there can be some protocols attached to it where communities usually have very strong protocols on how uh, their members should behave. And uh, a solution to like the legal challenge is, <clears throat> for example, to set up a DAO. So you can head to ostrodao.com, by the way, and set one up there on near. And then have, for example, a legal wrapper uh, attached to it, for example, a Swiss association. And the DAO provides all the benefits of acting on chain and the legal wrapper takes care uh, of the compliance part and makes sure that in, in the traditional world, every everything is being uh, properly addressed. And then obviously you cannot set like a, a crazy DeFi DAO up and put a legal wrap around, around it and think it's solved. Obviously it doesn't work, but there are so many use cases where uh, a legal wrapper can, can help in these regards, right? Yes, yes. I, I, yes may, maybe uh, just to add to that, uh, that there will have been some say, somebody who put that uh, program into place and uh, under the condition that the, you know, the, the participants voted to do that and that, this, uh, this, this smart contract did the harm. That, that would be uh, my, my, my first point. And the second point is, once you get to the person, it's probably nice to, to have a legal entity be, because that, uh, that shields you from, from liability because if you then really are acting uh, or an association, whatever, uh, 
if you there are then really acting as an individual, then then uh, you personally uh, might be uh, held liable in, in in the first place, which is something you you uh, probably don't want. Great. Uh, if if there are no further uh, questions, I think we can uh, call this uh, this uh, session to to an end. Uh, I mean, I'm I have a soft spot for Switzerland, so I I I, com I completely abide to your vision and to what you were saying, and it's it's clear that you know it's it's a burgeoning uh, ecosystem, and that Switzerland is is going to play a, a big role um, in it, especially I think for everything that you you all uh, mentioned uh, please if anybody wants has questions feel free to uh, reach out to us we'll connect them with the speakers if they want uh, any information happy to to share even the i guess the um, the presentation that uh, uh, matthias uh, uh, had earlier and anyway uh, i thank you all for for participating and hopefully have the follow-up conversations around switzerland but also around crypto and Deos and um, Web3 uh, with uh, our audience. Thank you so much. Thank you.